It says, see what an incredible quality of love the Father has given, shown, bestowed on us, that we should be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are. The reason that the world does not know and recognize and acknowledge us is that it does not know and recognize and acknowledge him. What an absolute privilege. What an amazing gift that we could be permitted to be called children of God. That word, the, the fact the Amplified adds the word permitted in there, I just love the connotation. It's not like, yee-haw, we we're, 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 we're children of God in our own right because we're just so godly. It's like we're permitted to by him, the one who is great, the one who is one, the one we're singing about, who we, should, who, who we should aim to know, whose love is relentlessly seeking after us. That's the God we, we, we can be named after. What a privilege to be called children of God. A privilege to be called children of God. That we even permitted that. It's not something we should just take lightly, like, oh, that's a separate teaching over there, and, and we've got all this other stuff, and the little part of that is that we are, per we are permitted to be called children of God. No, our life, our, our, our whole experience is, is all about being children of God, knowing him who is our Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. What an absolute privilege. You see, it, sometimes... When we're sharing certain messages, which we do all the time here about knowing God, really knowing him, not just, yes, knowing him in here, but not just knowing him in the, in the words, but knowing the word who is Jesus. We talk about all the time, and it's something we're going to continue to go over, and it's part of our mission as a church. When we do that, it's like sometimes you get the impression that all oh, this old stuff, do you not realize what a privilege it is that you could be called a child of God? It's not something to be taken lightly. We we're going to get on to that. We'll see how heavy it goes as we move down the, the, move down the scripture. It's an absolute privilege. It's an absolute privilege. Now, you don't need to turn to this, but you can if you like. This is in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, the power, the privilege, the right to become the children of God, that is to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. That is an amazing gift. Who owe their birth neither to the blood nor to the will of the flesh, that of physical impulse, nor to the will of man, that of natural father, but to God. They are born of God. Isn't that amazing? He gave us the right, the privilege, the, the, the power, the authority to become children of God. It's a different word in there for power. It's not the dynamite we've been talking about recently. It's not the dynamite that we've been talking about recently. It's the right, the privilege, the, the, the honor, the, the ability, the strength to be children of God. That is amazing. And it's not something we should take lightly. Not something that we should take lightly. But we're going back to 1 John, sorry, we're going back to 1 John 3. And maybe some of you didn't move from there. But it says in verse 2, it says in the King James now, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has the hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. He is pure. It's amazing to think that we, as children of God, if indeed we are, and there's a, there's a qualification for a child of God, that is someone who clings to, trusts in, relies on him, believes in him, believes in his name, who is, has a reliance on Jesus, and we're all called to be children of God. But it's also a case of, if we really are children of God, and he has been revealed to us, and we recognize that, then the world might not recognize us, but when we come face to face with him, we're going to find out who we really are. And we're on a journey now in life trying to find out who we actually are, and some people don't know who they are. Are we looking at the Amplified here? Yeah, and some people don't know who they are. But when we find him, we're going to be who we really are supposed to be. We're supposed to represent and resemble him. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to just hang around with our feet up and we're saved now and we've given our lives to Jesus and now we're just going to hang around and wait till Jesus comes back because then in, in the blink of an eye we're going to be like, like, like we're supposed to be. Some people get the impression of that. Well I've given my life to, I gave my life to Jesus, now I'm just going to hold on tightly till he comes back and when he comes back he'll just transform me like that. So what's the point in trying? 
The point in trying is that if you really are a child of God, you are seeking Him and His ways, and your childhood has already started, the childhood that's going to go on into eternity. You'll always be a child of God if you're a child of God. But it started now, and that continuation of the relationship happens now. You move, you grow. You, it's not something that, that, is, that, that you just sit back and, and relax about. You pursue Him. You grow in Him. We want to be like Him, amen? And it's not yet disclosed who we're going to fully be and what we're going to be like. There are some mysteries. There are some mysteries. We know in part. We see in part. But when He comes, the whole, the fullness will be revealed to us. We see through a glass dimly. You know, even our best sermons, our best theological studies, our best book writing or book reading, our best internet searches or whatever it is we're doing, even the best we can come up with is always going to be just a small part. It's through a glass dimly compared to what is really going to come. And that's partly why I say, not that I'm against like knowledge or, or seeking information and those things, but if you're seeking those things, you've got to put them in their place and recognise that they're going to be just done away with like that. Paul said that knowledge is going to be done away with and it's going to be superseded by truth. Who is the truth? Jesus is the truth, amen? So who are we going to seek? We're going to seek the truth. We're going to seek him as children of his, amen? If we recognise and accept that we're looking through a glass dimly, does that not bring some kind of freedom to you? That you don't need to have it all worked out? You see, if we didn't see through a glass dimly, let's just say we could see through into eternity and we could see Jesus fully as he is, is through completely clear glass and, 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 and we know it all, would we seek him like we should? Because we just know it all. The test in this life is to see whether you will seek him out when all you can see is through a glass dimly. There's freedom in knowing that we can't have this all worked out. There's freedom in knowing that we will not understand every single thing. We can only really understand what he, by his spirit, allows us to understand. But if we accept that, instead of seeing the things that we can barely see through the glass, we'll seek the one who's going to lead us to everything he wants us to do. Amen. If we seek after him and make him, him our great aim, that is what makes us children of God. And we're going to rep represent him. We're going to look like him. We're going to see him face to face. That's amazing. We're going to see him face to face. We all look forward to that day. But in the meantime... We're going to cling to him, amen? And verse 3, it said that everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. In the Amplified, and everyone who has this hope resting on him, ha, where's your hope resting? It's resting on him, cleanses, purifies himself just as he is pure, chaste, undefiled, and guiltless. So that proves us that while we're in this life, if we really are children of God and we're known as children of God, and you should be able to know who's a child of God, you should know that you're a child of God. It says that the world doesn't know who we are, but, but if you are a child of God, you should recognize someone who's a child of God by the Spirit of God that's in you. And even though the world might not understand who you are and what you're doing and your crazy Christian ideas, I'm crazy for Jesus ideas, even if they don't understand, who cares? We're going after him, amen? They're not going to understand unless he allows them to understand or draws them in. In the meantime, that's not going to put us off being who we're supposed to be. Where are we trying to fit in? I don't want to fit into the world. The world's already shown that it's unfaithful, that it's dodgy, that it, that it, that it only wants to use you, abuse you, and, and, and cause you all sorts of problems and never leave you satisfied or fulfilled. The world's already proved itself. I'm going after him. who doesn't need to prove himself because he is, he is who he is. He is Jesus Christ, King of heaven, amen. He's the Lord of love, the one who rescued us. He proved himself 2,000 years ago when he died on a cross for me, when he showed me what, he, what I really meant to him or what he was going to do for me. That's who I'm going to serve, amen. 
to even if the world doesn't recognize you go after him even if they don't understand don't let them conform you or cause you to conform don't let them cause you to back down don't let them make it oh well i better fit in no don't fit in stand out shine for him shine for jesus that's what we're called to why because we're children of god we have the right and the privilege to be called children of god amen and if we are if we have that hope if that's what we're looking to if we really do believe that, then we would purify ourselves. We would change. We would, we would get rid of the rubbish. We'd allow ourselves to, be, you know, to represent him as fully and as clearly as we can right now, not in our own understanding of what we think is a good idea, but by allowing him to change us and conform us and, to, and, and show us his perfect will. Amen? Everyone who commits and practices sin is guilty of lawlessness. For that is what sin is. It's lawlessness, the breaking and violating of God's laws by transgression or neglect, being unrestrained and unregulated by his commands and his will. Wow. Verse 4 in the Amplified. I know the Amplified has additional words in there, but we have to understand that the King James is limited because they've, just really, they've changed one Hebrew or Greek word into one English word. Sometimes they've added a couple in there and you can see it by italics. But, but most of the time they, they swap it word for word. But the, the Amplified Bible, even with its imperfections, still brings out more of an understanding of what is trying to be communicated by the original Greek words. And we all know that, you know, if you really want to look into it, you can look at a Strong's Concordance or a Strong's Definition. The most important definition you need is the one that Jesus Christ gives you. The most important definition and understanding of any scripture is the one by the Spirit that he confirms to you and shows you what he is, he, he's teaching, amen? He's our teacher, he's our guide, he's the one we're following, amen? If he says the scripture means that, I don't care if the whole world tells me it doesn't mean that. If he says it does, it does. By the way, when I say I don't care if the whole, whole, world, tells, old, whole world tells me that, I would still be humble enough, hopefully, to say, well, hang on a minute, there's a lot of information coming, I need to recheck. But I will still decide based on what he says is the truth, amen. I will allow the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me in what he's teaching. He's the one who has the monopoly on truth, amen. He hasn't shared it out. We don't all have a piece here and a piece there. He has the whole truth. He is the truth, amen. But I love the way that the Amplified opens this up and says that Whoever commits practices sin. Now this means practice, like continually carrying on sinning. It doesn't mean occasionally making a mistake. It doesn't, we all sin, don't we? We all fall short of the glory of God. We all miss the mark. We all um, miss God's perfect will somehow in, in the way we live. But if we habitually go after something that we know and know is wrong, now that is practicing sin. That is like, I'm, I'm just sinning and I don't even care. And that is not what a child of God would be doing. A child of God wouldn't want to do anything outside of his will. Why? Why? Because we want to show him we love him by obeying his commands, which is backed up by the, by the end of this verse where it says, it says um, lawlessness, because that is what lawlessness, uh, that's what it is. Sin is lawlessness, the breaking and violating of God's law by transgression or ne neglect, being unrestrained and unregulated by his commands and his will. So I'm going to put it to you that we as believers, if you want any evidence, maybe we should print that out and put it up there, or we should stick it somewhere that we're going to, it's going to grab our attention. Maybe that should be our new uh, uh, a tagline, uh, our new motto, a slogan for a war cry for Emmanuel Christian Centre. It won't be this. We'll turn it around. We'll say, as children of God, we want to meet his will. We want to do his will. We want to be the Christians. So we are going to be people restrained and regulated by his commands and his will. Amen. Restrained and regulated by his commands and his will. I'm just going to do what I want. No, I'm restrained. I'm regulated by what? By his commands, his will. Amen. That's how we're to live. I'm going to do what he wants. I want to glorify him. He knows what's best. Regulated regulated that's amazing regulators we'll be the regulators that sounds good we'll start a new group the regulators no we're not the regulators he's a regulator restrained and regulated by his commands and his will he has a will he wants to communicate that will it's real it's not something we do. We don't just go through this life trying to work it out, like, you know, bashing off, um, you know, this mistake and that mistake, and oh, that didn't work, and I'll go that way, and I'll try it. You know, and, and I do understand that everyone's communication with God is in different, wa is in different ways. You know, the teaching that 
where people say, uh, I just keep pushing doors to see if one opens. You're going to spend a lot of time pushing doors. And maybe a door opens because someone didn't shut it properly. I don't know. But like, you can, you know, this door opened and that door opened. I'm not going to go through a door that's open if he has not told me to go through that door. I don't need to try the door. I'll try the door he tells me to. And if that door's locked, I'm telling you he's going to open it. It's because I'm regulated by his will. I'm restricted. He's going to do what he wants. I want to obey his will, his commands. Amen. It's not like he just leaves us to it. He's very clear on his will. He knows what he wants to do. He's beaming his will all the time, even now. That's amazing. When I think of church meetings, talked about this a little bit in the AGM, and not just church meetings, it's like, because God may tell you not to be at a church meeting, so that's true. It's like any meeting. It's like we don't just, just nah, not, I don't feel like it. What's feeling got to do with it? Jesus didn't feel like going to the cross. You know what he said? Not my will, but yours be done, amen. The night before, the night before it actually happened. I don't feel like it. I just don't want to. I'm regulated by his will. I want to do his will, amen. I want to be controlled by him, and so should you too. He's an amazing God. We want to glorify his name. We want to, we want to do the right thing. You know, if we're parents, if, right, so we can be called children of God, right? That's amazing. We can be called children of God. Aren't, children, aren't parents judged by their children? I mean, maybe you don't realise that, but they do, don't they? I mean, people say, oh, they're a credit to their parents, aren't they? They don't say it to Josh. I saw him nodding there, so he's going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or sometimes they say they're a disgrace, don't they? Disgrace to the parents. Now, we don't know if that's true. We don't know if they're just rebellious, and I don't want to get into all that. My point is that as far as God is concerned, we want to bring him glory, don't we? We want to bring him credit. I remember my mum once, our kids, she must have thought they were doing quite well compared to how I turned out. I don't quite know what she means by that. Um, she came around one time and she, she was telling me as if to try and encourage me. She went, oh, they're a credit, those kids. They're a, cre they're a credit to Carol, those kids. <laughs> I was offended. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean, mum? Well, you know what I mean. I know you. She, she's done a great job. <laughs> Cheers, Mum. Well, don't we want to be a credit to God? Yes. Don't we want to be his, like, to, to bring him glory? Don't we want people to, when they look to us, to say, wow, your God is amazing. No wonder the scripture says, let your light shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There's a part of our good works where we want to keep them hidden. There's a part where... Certain things, by his spirit, as he leads, he tells you to do, and it's, and it's secret. Why? Because it's as unto him. The only audience you need is him. Okay? Giving can be like that, can't it? I mean, I've been to churches, and I don't mind if that's how they want to do it. That's, you know, maybe God's told them to do that. But they have a basket out there, like a box out the front, and they dance down the aisle with their tithe, da -da -da -da, and showing everyone how much it is, and putting it in there like that, and the pastor's clapping them. We might start doing that here. It'd be quite fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> Uh, you know, but, but like, there's something about, I want to do what God sees. That was a great lesson for me when I first became a believer. It's like, it's a new way of living. It's like, oh, I don't need to tell anyone what I'm doing. I, I don't, if I really trust him and really believe him, if I know he's watching all the time, I don't need to make a song and dance about it. I know he saw it. I found that in my training when I was training for, for ministry and uh, going through what they call the ordination process. It's like, well... These people say they can fail me. These people say that they will disqualify me if I do this, this, and this. And I thought to myself, no, hang on, hang on a minute. I'm serving one here. I'm serving Jesus. And I only get disqualified if he says so. So even if they don't see me doing something, I know I've done it as unto him. And I don't need to walk on fire for them. I'll walk on fire if he says to, if he's the only one around who sees it. Amen. Do you understand what I mean? So the point is, there are times when we are to, to be discreet just so that only he sees what we do and, 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 and he's glorified in that in some ways because we've been through that before, how he's glorified in heaven. But there's another side to good works that we clearly are called to be the light and for people to see. 
there are good works that we're called to do that glorify him and if he says to do something openly and it's normally something corporate but also in our own pri our, our own lives when you do something that he tells you to because you can't do a good work you came with how do you know what's a good work he knows what the good work is as you do the good works that he predestined that he planned that he that he knows what what's best about as you do those good works he is people see those good works and glorify your father in heaven i see that as like that's people saying, Whoa, he's a, they're, a credit to their, they're a credit to their dad, they are. That, that woman's a credit to her father. And that, you know, and that man's a credit to his father, who is our father. Our father is God. And that is how we want to live, amen? Live glorifying him. Live glorifying him even if there's no other audience, amen? But we're to cleanse ourselves. We're to be restrained and regulated. Matthew 5.19 says, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments of mine and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever breaks one of the least of Jesus' commandments, that's why we're to be restrained and regulated by his commands. Yes, they are commands from here, by the way. So let's not, let's not make this, they're not just things that, his will is things like he can make up at any point. His will is that I'm here today. His will is that, you know, this is happening there, or his will is that he wants you to do this, and that, that, that's his will, his plan, is that, that's all in his plan. But his commands are, 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 are really already written but he brings them alive to you that you obey them. But we're not to like throw the commands, ah, I don't need to do that, don't need to do that, don't need to do that, don't need to do that. You do whatever he said. He is the Lord. He knew what he was talking about. We are called to live the life. People say, well, there is no law now. We're not under the law. You're right you're not under the law. You've got a better system. When you're under the law, you have to memorize them all by yourself. Memorize them, know them. And if you brought one little command of the law, you broke the whole law. Imagine that thousands of thousands of commands trying to remember them and if you brought one you brought the whole law Jesus instead says I will bring back to your remembrance what I have taught you he will bring the scriptures back to our mind he will show us what 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 is yes we put information in we read we live by it but he will show us we live under a better system it's not like I'm not under the law now it's you are under the law you're under a different law but you can't live the law by yourself you're living it through Jesus he knows what the law is it's the law of love he's the only one who knows the law amen It's a bit like tithing, you know, giving, you, giving, giving some money to the church. Oh, no, I, I'm not doing that. That's law. Well, it might be. But what's he telling you to do? Because if you're throwing commands out, even if that's a little one, you're throwing it out. You're throwing it out. What does he say? He probably says more, doesn't he? He probably says, well, that was the law, but now you have the spirit and the life and the power within you to live things out more. It used to be that you just look at someone, you know, and fancy them. I don't know if that's the right word. No, look at someone lustfully. That's what Jesus said. And you've committed adultery. He's raised the standard. He's raised it. He's not lowered it. Now you just have to be angry with someone. We might get onto that in a minute if we've got time. Now you just have to be angry with someone and you've murdered them. Wow. How many people did you murder this week? As far as Jesus sees it. Because he sees the end from the beginning, doesn't he? He sees where that will lead to, what that will do. He, you see, it's not, murder didn't just happen instantly. There was something in the heart that caused that murder to come out. That's where murder starts. That's where adultery starts. That's where judgment starts. That's where all sorts of evils come from. They come from the heart. It's what comes out of a man in that way that is sinful. So we want to make sure that we obey his will. Obey his commands. Amen. Verse 5. You know that he appeared in visible form and became man to take away upon himself sins. And in him there is no sin, essentially and forever. Amen. No one who abides in him, who lives and remains in communion with and in obedience to him, deliberately, knowingly and habitually commits or practices sin. No one who habitually sins has either seen or known him or recognised, perceived or understood or has had an experiential acquaintance with him. Wow. If you're abiding in him, if you really do have communion, it's a communion service. See where we're going on this. 
to communion service, if you really do abide in him, if you really are doing his will, if you really are obeying his commands, if you really are a child of God, and many are, I'm not, I'm not questioning whether you are, I'm just saying if you are, then you're not going to habitually practice sin. That means you might make a mistake and learn from it, you might make it a few times and learn from it. But you're not outright going against him. You're not outright going against him, doing your own thing. If you are continually doing your own thing, continually sinning, continually doing something you know is grieving God, then you need to turn around. I was going to say repent, but everyone's scared of the word repent. You need to repent and turn to him and allow him to forgive you. Then walk out the new life that he wants you to live, amen? There's no way you have communion with God if you're continuing to sin in the same areas over and over again. At some point, you've got to put a break on or allow him to put a break on and say, whoa, this has to stop because there's only one outcome. I cannot be a child of God. I cannot be his. I cannot know him. I cannot be in communion with him if I'm continuing in this area that, that I know is wrong, amen? No wrong, you know it's wrong because he told you it was wrong. He says, boys, lads, let no one deceive and lead you astray. He who practices righteousness, who is upright, conforming to the divine will in purpose, thought and action, living a consistently conscientious life, is righteous, even, he, even as he is righteous. Wow. There you go. Everyone thinks, well, I'm righteous because of what Jesus did. I don't need to do anything. I just need to put my feet up now. I'm righteous because of Jesus. Are you? You might be justified because of Jesus. He can make you right. He can put you in a right position, but it doesn't make you righteous. Because whoever is righteous does righteousness. You live it out. But do not be deceived. Let no one deceive you and lead you astray. I don't know how. Let's look at, in the King James, little children. Let no one deceive you. That's clear, isn't it? Let no one deceive you. So here's a clear warning from Scripture to, to the whole church. Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. It's not about just being righteous by some sort of faith. Well, it is by faith, actually. But it means by practicing righteousness, practicing God's way of doing, of being right. If you really are righteous, you do the right thing. That's what it means. Amen? It says in the Amplified, righteousness it's someone who is upright. Someone who, is in, someone who practices righteousness is upright, conforming to the divine will again. In purpose, thought and action. Living an inconsistent, nope. Uh, and now and again, nope. When they want, nope. Living a consistently conscientious life. That's the person who is righteous, as he is righteous. Now, I'm not saying it to condemn anyone, to give everyone a hard time. I'm actually saying it to say that if you are not living that life, we've got to turn it around. Our Jesus is coming back. We're to abide in him, commune in him. We're to be found in him, amen? So if he's coming back and we're about to take communion, I want to just bring some, a level of reverence to it that we are called children of God. We carry his name. People are watching, people are seeing. And even if people don't see, he sees. He knows those that are his. And if you're righteous, you're doing the right thing, which is his will. You don't just work it out. I'm, woo! Hmm. Praise the Lord for restraint. <laughs> I do not like hearing the same thing over. Yeah, I'm just trying to work it out. I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm toying with the idea. Da, 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 da. Just do what he tells you to do. Amen. Now, we can use those words if we really mean we are praying about it. Do you know, do you know what I mean by that? There's a difference, isn't there? We might say, sometimes I'll say, yeah, I'm just thinking about, I don't really mean thinking. If I mean thinking, I mean in here, but he's in there, he's in control. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to get caught up in words. What I really want to get caught up is in his will, in living his purpose, living his purpose for our lives, in thought, purpose and action, amen? That's what we're called to. He's an amazing God. Verse 8. He who commits sin, who practices evil doing, is of the devil. Wow. Now, now, that could scare you, but it actually says here, takes his character from the evil one. For the devil has sinned, violated the divine law from the beginning. The reason the Son of God was made manifest and visible was to undo, destroy, loosen and dissolve the works the devil has done. Amen? Wow. Jesus came. So, we want to take our nature from our Heavenly Father, don't we? 
If there's an area in your life that you are practicing continually sinning in, if you're continuing to do it and you're not putting the brakes on and you're not seeking his will and you're not seeking freedom and you're not seeking to change, so you cannot be communing with him consistently. If you're doing that, that part of your character is taken from the rebellious one, the one who sinned from the beginning. Now, none of us here would want that, would we? But we have to be careful and say, no, I don't want anything to do with the devil, I don't want that. Okay, but just check your life to make sure there isn't something you're doing that you know is sin, but you keep doing it anyway, because that part of your nature is coming from him. But there is an answer, because Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of darkness, amen? That means that he can destroy the works of darkness in us if we would surrender to him and allow him to do what he wants to, amen? That's amazing. We're helpless without him, aren't we? Yet he, he's so merciful when we surrender to that love, that, that love that's so deep, that relentless love that he pursues us with. We surrender to that. And you'll find he's not a harsh God. That scripture there is to encourage you. You might think, well, I don't sound very encouraging. It's to encourage you, it's to, encourage you to be right. Be ashamed to find out down the line, wouldn't it, that you, you did something wrong and you missed it, or that it, something needed to be corrected. These scriptures are given for our correction, our, yeah, reproof, and but also our encouragement that the, for the training in righteousness. Amen. So let's make sure we're taking our nature from God. You see, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, didn't he? And we're called to do the same works. We can't do the same works unless we destroy, allow Jesus to destroy those works in us first. Amen allow him to do what he wants in us and once he's done what he wants once we've got the plank out of our own eye maybe we can see how to get the speck out of somebody else's maybe we can see how to destroy the works of darkness in someone else so many times and we've all done it so i can't just say you people or other people like we've all done it all at times we've passed information on to somebody that we've not even lived in ourselves we might have had a week of, of, of fear a week of absolutely you know feel like everything's caving in we're really scared it's all going to fall apart my life's going to fall apart meaning we don't trust god and then we see someone on sunday and they come and say oh I'm really scared about that oh don't worry just have the peace of God that passes understanding you just want to pass your cares on to him because he cares for you okay brother see you later or sister see you later yet you've had a whole week of being petrified it's like we get the works dealt in us first get the works the devil's works destroyed in us allow God to do what he wants allow God's love to permeate dwell to to, to commune to, to do the deepest work it can that we're free and then we can destroy the works of darkness in other people in, in a prisoner of war situation, everyone can be, anyone can be taken prisoner. And, and, and there's a way that Jesus, can set, Jesus came to set you free. But there's a different type of prisoner, isn't there? In, in prison, you know, if we're talking about a war scenario, there's, there's, there's prisoners who are there. They don't want to be there. They want to be free. I don't like this. I hate it. This isn't the will of my country. This isn't what the kingdom, my kingdom called me to do. I want to get out of this prison. And you're seeking help. You're calling out help. You're waiting for a team to come and break you out. You're looking for ways out. You're trying to get out. You're trying to chisel your way out. You're trying to do the escape from Alcatraz thing, dig your way out. You're doing whatever you can. But you're calling out to Jesus to, to break those prison doors, to smash them open. You're doing what you can. That's one type of prisoner. The other type of prisoner is the one that says, well, I don't like it here. But I'm going to work for the enemy. And, and because of their own selfishness and because of um, wanting something comfortable with them, they, they say, okay, I'll work for the enemy. I'll, work, I'll do menial tasks for the enemy. I'll, I'll clean their boots. I'll look after them. I'll, I'll clean their ammunition. I'll guard the other prisoners for them and get some brownie points. They're the most despised type of prisoner, aren't they? The ones that choose to surrender and work for the enemy once they've been caught. Do you understand what I mean? So we are called to find a way to get free and serve the king who called us rather than give in to the enemy who brings his tricks and his traps and his lies and his deceit. We're not called to cooperate. In some ways, maybe retaliate, but that's probably not the best word. We're certainly called to regulate our lives on the Lord Jesus Christ, on his teaching, his commands and his will. Amen. He says, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He goes on to say, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, 
but in deed and in truth. The Amplified says it's in practice and in sincerity. I want to just turn that around a little bit. And the reason I'm turning it around is because I'm not going to go through the in-between scriptures today, the parts in between. But we are called to serve him, amen. We're called to do what he wants us to do. We're called to be people of God, and that means we are to live the life in sincerity and in practice. That means we practice loving him, obeying his commands, seeking his will. We commune with him. We don't just know the, know the words or talk the talk. We want to walk the walk, the walk with Jesus. He is the way, amen? So check our lives. Check your lives. Let's all check our lives. And let's make sure that we're seeking after him and going after him, that we're loving him in reality. When we take communion, it's not something we want to just take and be weak and sickly afterwards. It's something we take with reverence and understanding of what Jesus actually did. He laid down his life for us. Therefore, we now lay our lives down for him and our brothers and sisters in actual practice. It means in reality. It means you actually do that. You do what he tells you to do. It's not about you anymore. It's all about your heavenly parent. It's about bringing him the glory. It's about people knowing who he is and maybe they see who he is in you. I'd just like to add, just um, in verse 9, just for anyone who might be struggling. So I'm jumping back up again now. I was about to close, but in verse 9, it says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Wow. Does that mean we can't sin if we are born of God? If we're born again, do we, do we not sin now? No, you can sin, but let's look what it says in the Amplified. No one born begotten of God deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practiced sin, for God's nature abides in him. His principle of life, the divine sperm, remains permanently within him, and he cannot practice sinning because he is born begotten of God. A point I want to put to you is that if when you are sinning, if when you are, if this is indeed you, if you are going against God's will, you're doing something you know is not right. If you're going against it, but you know it's not right and you feel aggrieved and you're like, I'm not happy about this and, and I know that's not right. Well, isn't that wonderful? That means that you can't continue because he is going to keep reminding you that what you're doing is wrong. If you're doing something wrong and you know it's wrong, you want to rejoice and say hallelujah because the point where you forget that it's wrong or don't know it's wrong is the point you're in the biggest danger of God giving up. If God is in you and the Holy Spirit is in you and that divine seed is in you, if you try and practice sin for the rest of your life, I believe he will be eh, not right, not right. You'll never be happy. You'll always feel guilty. You'll always be dissatisfied in what you're doing. You won't even like yourself. You won't even like what you're doing because he's going to be faithful to him. So I would say, remember that he hasn't rejected you. If, what you're, if you're doing something you know is wrong, he hasn't rejected you. Rejoice that he's still at work trying to say, no, no, don't do, stop, turn. That's a privileged place to be. The, heart, the, the, the place you don't want to be is where you willfully sin and you don't even know. Before I gave my life to Jesus, I did all sorts of things that were outright evil without any clear conscience kicking in. Like, like yeah, sort of maybe knew it's wrong, but it didn't even cross my mind that, oh, God wouldn't be happy with this. I mean, it wasn't even a thing. God was There were certain times when I did think about God, but generally I just do my own thing and it was horrible. But I didn't, he's like, it was fun. That's what we all do. That's what the world tells you to do. Some of the things they tell people to do in schools now are horrendous. They tell you to do these things and, and, and TV and movies and all sorts of things tell you this is what to do and you think that's cool. And it's a mess. But I didn't feel bad for it until Jesus got hold of me. And then I felt bad for the whole lot of it. Not just the bad, but the bad and good that I did. Everything that I did. It was all a mess compared to what he really wanted me to do. I felt ashamed. Because he now dropped in. His divine seed is now in there. So, if you are in that situation where you don't feel bad when you do something wrong, then turn to him, beg him, call out to him to get saved, to, to be born again. Uh, you know, cry out to Jesus. He will respond to a heart that diligently seeks him but if you are doing wrong and you know it but you know it's wrong then give God some thanks and say oh, wow you haven't given up on me yet there's still time for me to change amen amen if you thought today's message was heavy for you 
or you felt convicted? Well, there's an answer. I'll tell you how to fix that. You turn to that wonderful Lord and you cry out to him and watch him come flooding in with forgiveness and mercy. But then you're called to live the righteous life he's called you to. Live it out. Live it for him. Live it for that great king we sing about. Oh, what a saviour. Isn't he wonderful? Yes, we bow down before him. We live for him. We don't carry on sinning. Doesn't mean we don't sin. That means we don't habitually do it. I'm serving Jesus. Amen. In verse 24, all who keep his commandments, who obey his orders and follow his plan, live and continue to live, to stay and abide in him and he in them. They let Christ be a home to them and they are the home of Christ. And by this we know and understand and have the proof that he really lives and makes him his home in us by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. They let Christ be a home to them and they are a home of Christ. What a beautiful, it's poetic, it's beautiful. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to just visit. We're called to dwell, abide, live. Obey his orders, it says. Obey his orders, but dwell in him. Dwell in our heaven, dwell in our home. Let Christ be our home and let him be at home in us. We heard recently, or maybe not so recently, that we have to be people who say, Jesus, make yourself at home. Make yourself at home. And if he wants to turn the furniture around, if he doesn't like the music that's being played, if he doesn't like some of the things that are going on, guess what has to change? Not him. Make him at home. Allow him to be at home. Live like he can be at home. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for that privilege to be children of God. And thank you that you want to live in us, be at home in us. And we want to make our home in you. Lord, I ask that you would remind people of these words this week going forward, that you would bring back to their remembrance the things that you said to them personally, the things that were for them, that you would bring it back to their minds and that they would live it to be righteous, to live the right life, to be really, truly children of God. In your name, Lord. Amen. Amen.